Netflix is really starting to become the new home for cartoon shows. 2018 alone debuted Hilda, Final Space, Dragon Prince, Cupcake and Dino, Disenchantment, and one of my immediate favorites, She-Ra. It's a reboot of a show of the same-ish name from 1985, which was a spin-off of He-Man from 1983, which was based on a series of toys from 1982. This meant the character design of this and other shows of its kind looked very samey. I'm not saying this style is inherently bad, there was certainly a lot of very imaginative character designs even within these shows, but what kind of restrained them, even though they were still entertaining, trust me, I was a kid of the 80s, they were still basically glorified commercials to sell dolls, or action figures, which are the real dolls. Nope, wait, that's something else, don't look that up. Therefore, the majority of characters had to fit the same cookie-cutter design for mass production. He-Man sculpture was going to be the basic sculpture for everybody. Even the evil characters used the same legs, the same arms, the same torso. Of course, nowadays, cartoon shows are no strangers to tie in merchandise, but they can be more imaginative with the character designs without those same body type limitations. Unless they're those goddamn creepy Funko Pops. No, get it away. No! So Noelle Stevenson and their team are much more liberated when it comes to redesigning the She-Ra characters without having to worry about a single thing. Now, I'll say right here that you don't have to like the new designs and this video isn't going to change your mind. The beauty of art is that there's something for everyone and not everything is for you, and that's fine. For example, some might feel that She-Ra looks androgynous. She doesn't. In the original series, She-Ra had a very curvaceous body and a scant costume because her design is partially inspired by classic imagery of goddesses and, to fit into the He-Man universe, influences from Conan the Barbarian and the works of Frank Franzetta. The new She-Ra has been aged down, so her body reflects that. It's less sexualized because she's just a 17, 18 year old stepping out to the big, wide, colorful world and discovering herself, which is what the show is all about, just with magical sword powers and a talking horse. There's nothing wrong with sex appeal being part of a character's design. I just did a video that had Jessica Rabbit in it after all. It can still be empowering without being exploitative. It's just not relevant here. Sorry if this genuinely upsets you, but if it helps, here's a colon and the number eight. And at some point, they'll pass each other. So if you hit pause at the right time, they'll look like a pair of boobs. Have fun. I'm not a character designer, as you can tell, but I'm trying to learn more about animated shows and what goes into making them. And making videos like this helps me learn more, like copying someone else's homework but rewriting it in your own words so that Mr. Wheeler never finds out. So this is my gross oversimplification of what I've learned about character design using She-Ra 2018 as an example. Side note, these aren't strict rules, more like a guide that can be applied and ignored as you see fit. That's the other beauty of art, you can do whatever the f*** you want. Step 1. Know your character. The character's personality should shine through their design like a sunny day. Take someone like Sponge. Bob. His personality is unbridled joy, so he's been designed with large eyes, a huge smile, and a wildly expressive body. In She-Ra, Catra has been made quite scrawny so that she comes across as scrappy and a bit of an underdog. Or under cat, I guess. Her different colored eyes could be a reference to the character's conflicting feelings. Her old human form and cat form have been merged into a hybrid, which allows for more body language. Is that a mouse? What? Where? <laughs> with her ears displaying her emotional state, much like Judy Hopps, which is one of her quirks. Rick Sanchez is a spontaneous, reckless, self-destructive mess of a human, so this is displayed with his wild hair and lots of drool. In She-Ra, Entraptor is obsessed with technology, so despite not being typically princess-like, That is so smart! And awful! We're all gonna die! She's dressed with thick gloves, stained clothes, and a welding mask, so she's ready to tinker with tech at a drop of a miniature cupcake. A pig! So cute. She's also so scatterbrained that she's constantly recording things in a log, which brings me to props and accessories. Henny's Parker that muffles his voice, Popeye and his spinach, Edake with his weird left mouth, hey! and She-Ra, of course, with her hair. Oh, how weird I thought I was gonna say sword. Adora is practical and straightforward, so she has a no-frills ponytail. This is in stark contrast to her alter ego, She-Ra, she has better hair. whose hair is massive and evokes feelings of boldness and empowerment. The elements of Adora carry over, so the costume is still practical with the addition of shorts and straightforward with the top being buttoned up military style, reflecting her upbringing and training. The more you know your characters, the easier these design choices will come to you, essentially making them do the hard work for you. Oh, Mr. Edith, 
dear, I, I've done your homework for you. Um, Hubert, what is this? Uh, I did it in cursive handwriting like you told me to. Yes, but you've done it in the Palmer method. Mr. Wheeler's gonna have my neck if it's not done in the Danelian cursive writing style, Hubert! Danelian! <laughs> Step two, diverse shapes and colours. First impressions are important, so the body shape should tell us a lot about the character before they even speak, like judging a book by the shape of its cover. And this is commonly done with circles, squares, and triangles. Let's look at Steven Universe. Garnet is made out of a square, as she is the strong, firm leader of the group, but the edges are rounded off, showing that she has a soft side too. Amethyst is mainly circles, which suits her easy-going, carefree nature. And Pearl is a triangle, but also a circle, forming a teardrop, as Pearl is prissy, but sometimes delicate. A mix of shapes creates a mix of feels. It's just working out what combination of shapes best portray your character. Who's that Simpsons character? <laughs> Giving your character a unique silhouette helps tell characters apart. Let's try that again with Who's that Ninja Turtle? A bit harder that time, isn't it? So it makes sense they're constantly redesigning the characters. I really don't know Michelangelo. I'm Raphael. Oh. The original series of She-Ra had a difficult task having to conform to the mold of the same body design across the board, but the reboot series is able to have a cast with an array of body shapes, which in turn is more representative of the broad spectrum of bodies of women. The character Spinnerella has been met with criticism because she is, in massive quotation marks, fat, which is apparently fat. Surprise science lesson! Sometimes people are just big, and sometimes it's nothing to do with eating a lot, and even if it is because they ate a lot. So what? There's this concept of the perfect woman who looks this certain way, and because women may not look that way, they're scrutinized. Representation really does matter. If nothing else, it helps tell your characters apart. This goes for skin color too. Speaking of color, this is something the original series got right. Well, not the skin color, but the clothes. Colors can contribute to evoking a strong emotion, especially in the character's design. Glimmer is comprised of mainly pinks and purples. Pinks evoking sensitivity and caring, whilst purples evoke royal which makes sense being a princess and the daughter of the only on-screen queen. That sounds like a metal album. Oh, on-screen queen. That's Abba. That's just straight up Abba. Colours can mean different things, like purple can also mean luxury, romance, or even death. And Traptor is also comprised of purples, but she has a much different personality to Glimmer. It's just a case of playing around with what feels right for your character. It's all about interpretation. What does that mean? I'll let you decide. Step 3. Simplify and exaggerate! You see this often with comic strips or cartoon shows that have been going on for a long time. The designs evolve and change but keep the core elements intact. And there's naturally some real life considerations. Shows may only have a limited budget and it's unrealistic to expect them to maintain highly detailed animation all the time. The original series, while arguably more detailed, also frequently used what's called stock. Recycled animation that was rotoscoped with actors and then repeated where possible due to the amount of episodes required in the short space of time. Five days a week, you've got to be at least 13 original weeks. That adds up to 65 half hours. And that adds up to working year round for all the animators. You see this recycled animation all the time with Scooby Doo and even some Disney movies. So shortcuts are common and the flashy stuff is reserved for key moments, but done stylistically, this is easy to overlook and maybe not even notice. But where you might strip some elements back, you may want to exaggerate others. Both Western and Eastern animation frequently share the trope of giving their animated characters big eyes. They're the focal point for audiences and provide enough expression to convey a range of emotions even if the character doesn't speak. The characters of She-Ra don't have much in the way of exaggerated bodies, following in the footsteps of the more semi-realistic proportions as seen in shows like Voltron, but they do have large eyes, sometimes even larger eyes, taking cues from anime influences just like the He-Man series did in its own reboots. Noel Stevenson and their team have done wonders with She-Ra because, well... We need something new to come along for kids because if we don't, unfortunately, Heeman and Shear are going to die. They're going to go away. But there's things in here that help define who we are. If they carry over to something new, might help define a new generation. The 1980s series might have ultimately been a tool to sell toys, but it was one of the very few female-led action cartoons of its time, and it granted many women unique opportunities to flesh out a world, story, and characters in a largely male-dominated industry. If you were a woman, even if you drew like Michelangelo, they still would give you a minor 
a role. The man did not like the idea of working with a woman. Because back then it was a boys club. It was rare for women in animation to have such high-ranking roles, but it's this spirit of progressivism, equal opportunity and inclusivity that is championed by the new series, managing to make something that both pays homage to the history. I'm not alone. I've got room here. And my friend Luki too. But he's always hiding. Was forging a path forward of their own design. And they also sell toys. Mr. Headache, sir. What is it, Hubert? Uh, sorry, sir. Mr. Wheaton's confiscated all your toys. Damn you, Hubert! Hey everyone, sorry this video is so late, but uh, special thanks to Rebecca Parham and Katie Nitt for their help with the script, and please support me on Patreon. Yeah. My son Rick is here too. Did you like the video? No. <laughs> Somewhere out there someone needs me. I don't know how or where, but believe